thank David and all his staff, especially Leona uh, Ferran, for their great help in making these files available at a very difficult time, both online and in Peroni, and facilitating the press generally and covering them. It was a tremendous task in the circumstances we were in. Um, we had over 600 files released this year. Um, some of them not files that we expected. We expected more about Drum Cree, uh, 1997. They have been withheld, I think, because of problems in the departments, because of the pandemic. But we did find a lot of very interesting material. Of those, um, 450 files were fully open. And if you think back to 1997, we've got a flavour there, but it began with a low-level continuation of the IRA campaign, which had been resumed mainly in, Great, in England, but also in Northern Ireland after the breakdown of the ceasefire uh, in 1996 at Canary Wharf. Um, uh, Inter-party uh, inter talks had resumed at Stormont, um, and of course they included the two loyalist parties. The Sinn Féin was excluded because of the resumption of violence with the IRA. Um, and of course, in the wake of very serious violence at Drum Creek, in the summer of 1996, the North report recommended the establishment of a parades commission, and that would become a major issue in the years ahead. Uh, it would adjudicate undisputed marches. On February the 12th of that year, a young soldier, Stephen Resterick, was killed by an IRA sniper in South Armagh, um, which brought home to people that, you know, there was a potential for, for violence to continue um, into the future. Uh, behind the scenes, John Hume, uh, who had been involved in the Hume-Adam talks from the late 80s and trying to break the deadlock, um, secretly informed the NIO that he was seeking to re-establish the ceasefire by, by involving a group of Protestant churchmen. Um, in March, there was fury when Jerry Adams uh, was quoted as telling Sinn Féin activists that the recent nationalist protests against Orange Perez were part of a, a Sinn Féin strategy. And in April, you remember, the Grand National at Aintree was delayed for two days because of an IRA bomb scare, part of a wave of explosions in Britain at that time. Um, of course, the big story of that year was the change of government in May with the Labour landslide. Labour coming in under Tony Blair and Dr Mo Molan, the new Secretary of State um, for Northern Ireland, the first woman to hold the job. Um, Blair's famous speech in Belfast that summer talked about um, the agenda of the, the Labour government was not a united Ireland and that the um, uh, settlement train was leaving the station. Um, and this, of course, was the background to the resumption of the IRA ceasefire uh, on the 19th of July 1997, but not before two RUC men had been shot dead um, in the noonday sun in Lurgan by the IRA um, in the middle of June. Um, and of course, those talks would resume as soon as Sinn Féin was admitted in September, the DUP and the UKUP, Bob McCartney's smaller unionist party, left. And the year ended, of course, with a change of government in the South, with the um, a new Fianna Fáil Progressive Democrat coalition led by Bertie Ahern, and finally Mary McAleese was elected Irish president uh, in October of that year. Um, so a lot going on in that year, even though the agreement is not signed until um, Good Friday 1998. Um, and just looking at that John Hume initiative for a moment, uh, this year, of course, we had the files coming to us online and you tended to go through every page and very deep in one archive of correspondence from um, really the um, head of the NIO, Sir John Chilcott, was a two page memo on a phone call from John Hume. The phone call was dated February 9, sorry, January the 6th, 1997, um, almost a year after the IRA ceasefire had broken down uh, at Canary Wharf. It was circulated to the Secretary of State, Patrick Mayhew, ministers and officials. And Hume had phoned um, Chilcott on the weekend. His main point was he was trying to restart an initiative to bring about an IRA ceasefire using the medium of Protestant churchmen. Uh, he didn't name them over the phone, but Chilcott seemed to know who he was talking about. Whether that was the group centered on the Reverend Roy McGee, we can't be sure, but it possibly was. Um, and again, according to the memo, um, Hume now realized that the Hume Adams text of October 1996, just before Christmas, had no future, following a statement by John Major, the British Prime Minister. And he believed that Hume was showing a high degree of realism, given the difficulty of David Trimble and the Ulster Unionists who were at the talks table um, in, if you like, um, accepting Sinn Féin admission to the talks in present circumstances. Um, he said that 
Hume was disappointed, particularly on the, on the decommissioning issue and on the uh, results of bilateral discussions at Stormont between his part of the SDLP and the, the Ulster Unionists. But he, he understood the reason why David Trimble was having to harden up his position, obviously in advance of the spring election of that year. Um, so uh, we can see that Hume is very active during this period in trying to bring about uh, a ceasefire. Um, and uh, again, of course, we have um, the fallout from Drum Cree 1996, that very, very violent summer. I think Queen's University changed their graduation dates to suit um, uh, progress of uh, parents of students from the country to Belfast because roads were being blocked, protests were being held. This had been building up uh, and reached a crescendo in 1996 with violence in both communities. And this resulted in sectarian boycotting of Protestant businesses, really, from um, the summer of 1996 into 1997. Um, the issue was highlighted in a letter to the Secretary of State, Patrick Mayhew, um, from the chairman of the, um, the Forum, the Northern Ireland Forum, which was meeting in central Belfast. Um, and uh, Sir John Gorman, the chairman of this unionist-dominated body, the SDLP had walked out as a protest against the um, Drum Cree uh, decisions that summer. Um, and uh, he uh, reported that um, the uh, forum um, was very much, very much exercised by stories of sectarian boycotts and they who said that any form of discrimination whether it was in the form of boycotting of businesses or any other was wholly unjust. Nonetheless uh, groups of traders began to arrive beating at the doors of Stormont Castle from September 1996 on from Cookstown uh, an Ulster Unionist councillor said that the boycott and associated criminal activity had placed the trade traders backs to the wall. Now there was some scepticism in NIO circles about this because BSE, uh, the agricultural disease, had been wreaking havoc in rural areas and had seen a, a depression in farm incomes and there was a feeling that there may be an attempt to sort of play up the boycott to uh, seek compensation as it were for financial losses. This was just expressed by some civil servants. But the issue was raised by the Presbyterian moderator, the Reverend Harry Allen, in an address in Dublin. Um, he linked the boycott to the Drum Cree standoff that July and said, the spirit of boycott has been excused as punishing those who manned barricades during the Drum, Drum Cree standoff. But the fact, he said, was that in small towns where Protestants were in a minority, um, the uh, sinister forces were creating conditions where every Protestant business was being targeted. And he said this, of course, was leading to a counter threat uh, in some towns to boycott Catholic businesses. And he pointed, of course, to the um, blockading of Harryville at Roman Catholic Church in Valenina, which began in September 1997 as well. Um, the boycott was considered by the operations division of the NIO. It's a huge complex of the NIO, all sorts of divisions of uh, civil servants dealing with all sorts of aspects from elections and politics to talks. Uh, to parades, to Drum Cree. And uh, in his assessment, um, an official Tom Clark said there was plenty of evidence of a boycott campaign, but it was difficult to, uh, if you like, crystallize concrete evidence that Sinn Féin and the provisional IRA were playing a coordinating role. Having said that, Sinn Féin's public position was that the boycott was justified against those who had taken part uh, in the events surrounding Drum Cree, but should not be used indiscriminately against Protestants. Um, Clark informed uh, the Secretary of State that his latest information was that the boycott was strongest um, in Pomeroy and the Jerome, in the city of Armagh, and continued also in the Fermanagh towns of Enniskillen, Rosslea, uh, and Newtown Butler, though there were signs that it was receding. And he said that intelligence uh, to the NAO suggested that uh, the campaign has a certain amount of orchestration at a local level by Sinn Féin, but it was not top down, but was bottom up. And he acknowledged that many nationalists were, quote, angry about Grand Cree and see the boycott of businesses owned by those identified with Orangism as legitimate. Um, so the whole situation went on, but then of course, um, 
Jerry Niles or Jerry Lockrell, the head of the Department of Economic Development, reported in November 1996 that he had met the leaders of the main banks in Northern Ireland. And they said that a boycott on any scale was not registering with them, and they suspected that the matter was being hyped up deliberately. Um, then the NAO began to request reports from the various council areas across the region. From Armagh, the council's chief executive uh, informed the Central Community Relations Unit, the Stormont, that 78 to 80 percent of businesses in Armagh, the business in Armagh, was from the Catholic community, and that most unionists tended to shop in Portadown and other towns. However, a number of Protestant shops continued to be boycotted post Drum Creek. Uh, the most alarming report came from Limavady. It seemed a quiet time, really, um, near the city of Derry, stroke Londonderry. And the local community relations officer there, a man identified as S. Bell, painted a very bleak picture in the autumn of 1996 of community relations in the North Derry area, uh, Limavady and nearby Dungiven. In Dungiven, uh, an overwhelmingly nationalist village who reported widespread intimidation and attacks on the Protestant community. Protestant farmers had received threats and intimidating um, phone calls, and Protestant clergy were being attacked, uh, both physically and verbally. Literally, he said, Protestants in the area are living in fear of their lives. According to Bell, in Limavady itself, which had been a unionist town in the 60s, uh, Ivan Cooper had been holed up in the town hall by a loyalist mob in 1969, but clearly things are changing, because in Limavady, business owners, uh, privately acknowledged a consolidated attack on all Protestant businesses. There appeared, he said, to be an all-out effort by RCs to buy Protestant commercial and residential property in the town. Turning to industrial jobs, the official claimed that the area was being swamped by Catholics from Derry and Donegal because the Donegal workers uh, met the manpower, uh, manpower requirements of new companies such as Seagate in the locality. And also, he said, 300 students from Donegal had come to reside in the Mavadi from Letterkenny. They had a very nationalist stance and are most intimidating and abusive. And the Protestants were, were beginning to migrate to Coleraine, seeing no hope for the future. Now, that is the only report, really, that strikes that kind of note. Um, boycotting uh, existed in Fermanagh towns, but not on this kind of scale, according to the reports. It's interesting that in the middle of all this, really, in January 1997, it shows you how long it lasts. This is six months after Dunkree. There was a proposal from Archbishop Robin Eames of Armagh that the Secretary of State should actually visit Pomroy and uh, show solidarity with the businesses which were being boycotted by Catholic customers. Um, and he actually phoned the office, the Archbishop phoned the office. But this request was escalated to J.M. Steele, a senior NIO official. Um, and he discussed this matter with um, Sir John Wheeler, um, a junior minister, and the RUC chief constable, Ronnie Flanagan. And their opinion was that no useful purpose would be served by such a high-profile visit as Patrick Mayhew going to unionist businesses in um, Pomeroy. Uh, it would not stem the course of events for the Protestant businessmen. And um, even more importantly, um, comparisons would be drawn with the fact that no ministers had appeared at Harryville and Ballymena, where a Catholic church was being picketed by loyalists. So quite an interesting story there on the fallout that we didn't hear that much about in press uh, of these boycotts, which seemed to have more, more or less faded out by the end of 1997. There's no talk about it really later in the year. Um, but there is a file on the uh, regular weekly loyalist uh, boycott uh, uh, picket, I should say, on um, Our Lady of um, Mercy Catholic Church in Harryville, a suburb of Ballymena. Um, this boycott, uh, this blockade began from September 1997 and ran right through, really, until the summer of 1999. Um, an NIO uh, memo issued under the um, 30, 20 year rule, as we're moving, as you know, from a 30 year rule 10 years ago to a 20 year rule under Stormont um, uh, guidelines. Um, Anyway, uh, a memo describes what's happening there. Apparently it began in the autumn of 1996 in response to nationalist obstruction of orange parades in Dunloy, a nationalist village in North Antrim. The boycott was described as sinister by SDLP politician Sean Fallon, um, who said that 
placards would encourage vilifying local nationalist councillors. Um, however, the NIO memo pointed out that the um, picket had been condemned by a very broad spectrum, from the head of the Orange Order to the mayor of, ba of Balamina. But this had not deterred a hard core of demonstrators um, who um, had come week, week after week on Saturday evenings to the vigil mass at the church. Following violent clashes between 500 loyalists and the RUC, uh, the RUC at the church uh, on the 26th of November 1996, a meeting was held between J.M. Steele of the security division of the NIO and the assistant chief constable, uh, ACC Beanie of the RUC. The ACC explained that the police were gradually increasing their profile. They had hoped the uh, Harryville picket would would simply die a natural death, but in view of recent violence at the church, an attempt to burn it down uh, during the week, um, he believed that a much more preemptive attitude by the police was justified and would be well accepted by the community in Balamina, most of whom abhorred this particular sectarian action. Uh, the RUC, he said, would throw a cordon around the area to ensure that troublemakers were kept away from the church and so on. Um, he wrote, the uh, uh, RUC chief constable wrote, the RUC are very conscious of the danger that this might lead to repercussive attacks um, outside Balamina itself. Um, and uh, in um, a reference to the events at the church, uh, he said that um, uh, they were almost certainly being worked up by the North Antrim UDA UDP and had been roundly condemned by the UVF-linked politician David Irvine um, and Ronnie Flanagan told a meeting of the Anglo-Irish uh, Anglo uh, Intergovernmental Conference in March 1997 that the picket represented rampant sectarianism. It finally ended after several um, loyalist attempts to burn the church in May 1999. So it brings us back to a dark enough time between the breakdown of the ceasefire and the resumption of the ceasefire. Another good story that I find just in these shorts to, um, concerns the dialogue between uh, the two sides of the um, British-Irish Secretariat. Remember that the Secretariat was set up under the Anglo-Irish Agreement of uh, 1985 and sat at Maryfield, just outside Hollywood Palace Barracks at that time, often the scene of uh, sieges by um, unionists and loyalists in the early days of the agreement. What concerned uh, David Donoghue, um, the head of the Irish section of the Secretariat was the sudden transfer of the leading loyalist Billy Wright um, uh, from segregated accommodation at McGabbery Prison in County Antrim to the nearby Mays Prison for his own safety. This seemed a bit odd to Donoghue and the Irish side that he was being moved from a very secure location to the Mays where there were many sort of uh, wings with Republican prisoners. Um, and at a delegation meeting of the Secretariat in April 1997 the Irish Joint Secretary David Donoghue raised the question of rights transfer and he voiced Irish concerns about this being sinister and would have implications for the loyalist ceasefire which had been very close to breaking down as IRA violence continued at a low level during this period of the spring of 1997. Recognising Irish concerns, Peter Bell who was the British counterpart, the British head of the Secretariat, said that the decision uh, of the prison agency to transfer right to the maze um, uh, was made on pragmatic grounds and for, for the maintenance of order within the prison system. And he said that the Secretary of State, Patrick May, who had been consulted, of course, as we know, the move would prove fatal for Billy Wright, uh, responsible for multiple sectarian murders in Mid-Ulster in the 1980s and 90s, because on December 27, just after Christmas 1997, he was shot dead by INL, uh, INLA prisoners whose compound adjoined his cell at the Mays prison. So it's an amazing how that worked itself out. And the only people surprised at it uh, on these, in these records were Irish civil servants serving um, uh, in Belfast at the time. Can you hear me all right? I've just lost uh, any sense of a picture. Um, I hope that means that everything is okay and a red light will flash if it's not. Um, one big issue of these years revealed in these files concerned the 150th anniversary of the Great Irish Famine on Gautamore, which was commemorated by uh, the Republic um, in 1995 to 97. Uh, landmarks were placed on various famine graveyards up and down the country. Um, commemorations were held in Ireland and in the Irish diaspora. And proposals to mark the anniversary of the famine um, with an ecumenical service in Liverpool um, 
uh, were actually vetoed by the British Prime Minister John Major in 1996. Such an event, uh, Major decided, involving uh, members of the British government, even members of the royal family, quote, would look like an apology for the famine and would offer unionist sensitivities and would defend unionist sensitivities in Northern Ireland. Um, now, the possibility of a British memorial event to mark the famine was raised by Chris McCabe. Um, he was a, a local member of the NIO's Political Affairs Division in August 1994. He had been alerted by two sources, the uh, Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington, which was concerned that there might be attempts by Republicans, Irish Republicans, as so many Republicans in America now, to link um, the famine commemoration to um, um, the British presence in Northern Ireland uh, in the present day. And secondly, of course, he was informed by the Anglican Rector of Liverpool, a man called Canon Nicholas Frayling, that the Canon was planning um, a service of contrition in Liverpool Anglican Cathedral in the following year, 1995, in which the canon said Britain can express its deep regret for its treatment of Irish citizens during the Great Famine, which lasted, of course, from 1845 to 1851, which saw a million deaths, a million people emigrate, mainly to the United States, and uh, massive changes in uh, the Irish population, agriculture, the decline of the Irish language, so much else, of course. Um, and I think the canon expected uh, Chris McCabe to respond positively, but he wrote, to the canon's disappointment, I was less than enthusiastic, uh, making uh, the point that the dreadful events of the 1840s must be seen against the laissez-faire background of the time. And McCabe felt that uh, any attempt to remember the famine in the shock city of the great famine in Britain, saw so many Irish immigrants um, make their ingress into Britain, um, could stir up um, more emotion than it's spent. McCabe's memo drew a response from my old friend, probably in the room, Tony Canavan of the NIO, who uh, warned uh, the importance of striking a position between the two extremes, the kind of John Mitchell genocide view of the famine and as kind of an attempt to kind of airbrush it out of history. And uh, uh, Dr. Canavan nurtured the strong suspicion that London would have reacted differently if a similar to a similar agricultural catastrophe in Wiltshire or in Wales. Now, no one else continued this debate. It became much more politicized thereafter. And suddenly a dispatch reached the NIO and the Foreign Office from the British ambassador in Ireland. She was Veronica Sutherland. She had very good relations with the Irish government. And um, in a dispatch to the NIO in October 1995, she noted that um, Avril Doyle, had been appointed the junior minister to deal with famine commemorations um, in the Dublin government. She'd attended several events, notably um, an ecumenical service in Tuam, where the um, if homilist was, of course, uh, Archbishop Robert Eames of, of Armagh. And uh, she said she's felt that uh, at these events, nobody had suggested any formal apology by uh, Whitehall. And uh, she felt that um, the only person who had demanded it was Bertie Ahern, and that was for political reasons, she believed. Um, and she was impressed by the Irish government's approach. Um, uh, so Mrs. Doyle and her discussed the idea of an, uh, of an ecumenical service in Liverpool Cathedral similar to the one held in Tuam um, under the auspices of Archbishop Eames. The ambassador felt this had many attractions and uh, she noted that um, Archbishop Eames had, uh, uh, had called, if you like, for reconciliation at the County Galway event. And she said this would be an effective way of acknowledging the past without engaging in the fruitless exercise of apology. Well, Ambassador Sutherland's idea drew a positive response initially from the Northern Ireland Secretary, Patrick Mayhew, might do a lot of good, he said, and also by the Foreign Secretary, um, uh, if you like, um, Malcolm Rifkind at that time. Um, but of course, as it was mulled over by civil servants and we approach um, June 1996, there's a reference by uh, Kate Vinil in the Republic of Ireland Department of the ETSIO referring to the tortured question of the, the proposed ecumenical service to commemorate the Irish famine. One man who was not keen on the idea was Peter Bell, senior official at the NIO. And in January 96, he regarded the proposal with dismay. Now, in a heavily redacted memo, lots of blanking out to enable the file to be opened, he felt that by hosting such a service, the British risked 
perpetuating the Republican view of Irish history, whereas the great problem is Britain's relationship with Ireland. He argued the real problem was relations between the two communities in Northern Ireland. And these fears were shared by Malcolm Rifkin, the British Foreign Secretary, who spoke of the, the service possibly provoking recriminations against Britain from Irish nationalists. Fresh difficulties emerged in February 1996 when the NIO reported that um, they found that um, several leading Protestant churchmen in Northern Ireland uh, were unenthusiastic. They included Robin Eames, who had, uh, if you like, spoken at the ecumenical service in Galway uh, a year earlier. Um, uh, the Archbishop recalled that he'd been criticised by Northern uh, Protestants for his involvement in the Chum service, and he had found this, quote-unquote, a chastening experience. This development, coinciding with the breakdown of the IRA ceasefire, prompted Mayhew to withdraw his support. Um, and indeed, um, uh, in, a, in a statement, um, Dominic Chilcott, who was a Rifkin's private secretary in a, in a, in a memo, um, he wrote to um, um, John Major's private secretary that um, the Bishop of Liverpool, Church of, Church of England, favoured a highly penitent service with HMG the British government taking the role of penitent. This, he said, could do more harm than good. The last word was left to John Major. In a note to the Foreign Office on March 9, 1996, Major's private secretary wrote, the prime minister was very dubious about taking this famine proposal forward. Um, whatever we say, the government and arguably royal attendance at such a service would look like an apology for the famine and would surely revive debate about whether we owe such uh, an apology. And Major wrote, the unionists are unlikely to sympathise. In fact, with the change of government that summer, uh, that June, actually, Tony Blair issued an apology for Britain's involvement in the Irish famine. Just an interesting story, showing you how sensitive these things were, historical events, um, and we're dealing with them right now in the year of the Synod, 1921, as we all know. An old file surfaced, sometimes files that were closed for 200 years when I started this business, in the dark ages, way back, um, when more files were closed than opened back in the uh, late 1970s for research students scrambling for the evidence. Um, but a file suddenly emerged on the internment of IRA suspects during the Second World War. Would you believe that over 800 IRA suspects from Belfast and across uh, rural Northern Ireland were interned in the Alwadar prison ship in Strangford Lock in Crumlin Road Jail, in Derry Jail, uh, during the Second World War. This folder is very, very detail detailed. Um, the first document dates from December 1938, you know, um, less than a year before the outbreak of World War II, and it relates to the internment of 34 Belfast men. Um, uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, internment warrants are signed by Sir Dawson Bates, who was not just the hardline Minister of Home Affairs, um, a man who had refused to use a telephone in the early 1930s when he heard that a Catholic telephonist had been hired at Stormont, and he didn't use the phone apparently the until she was dismissed. Nonetheless, he had been a major figure in Unionist resistance to Home Rule and the rise of the UVF in 1912-14. And it's amazing that the list gives not just a list of names, but it gives their local unit. For example, Frank McGrogan of North Queen Street, Belfast, described as a window cleaner and officer G Company, Belfast Battalion. Uh, a man I interviewed many years ago, Sean McNally of Ardley, of Ardley Street, a later Nationalist Party councillor, um, is described as a principal leader in the IRA. Um, and indeed, there's a Dominic Adams from the Lower Falls, who is obviously um, a relative of uh, Jerry Adams. Uh, former Sinn Féin president, um, looking through these. Um, the internments, of course, which intensify in 1939 uh, on the eve of war, are condemned by the British press. The News Chronicle, for example, um, talks about um, um, a system in Northern Ireland paralleled only by continental dictatorships. And there are um, resolutions criticising the act from, for example, the colleague Harlech in, in Wales, uh, sent to the Governor of Northern Ireland, from the Labour Party of Northern Ireland and others. And in fact, when the only two nationalist MPs attending Stormont um, raised the cases of nationalist internees in May 1939, these are T.J. Campbell, um, a King's Council and future County Court judge, and Richard Byrne, both Belfast MPs, um, the Minister, 
um, Dawson Bay suggested that they should ascertain from their friends in ERA when these attacks on Northern Ireland are going to cease. Eventually, of course, uh, in May 1945, with uh, VE Day, um, the um, IRA men are released. And there's a final statement for Edmund Warnock, who was the new Minister of Home Affairs. In addition to taking steps to defend our shores from possible invasion, and play our full share of the war, the government had to guard against the activities of this fifth column in our midst. A phrase used by Brookborough in relation to the nationalist minority um, in a letter to another uh, unionist politician in 1941. These people are a fifth column in our midst. If I was a German general, I would use them. Just a little bit about uh, the incoming Labour Secretary of State, uh, State Mo Molam. I know that um, my friend Sam is about to talk about her impact at Stormont in a particular way. There's a very, very colourful account of a lunch hosted by the Joint Secretariat, Irish and British, at Maryfield for the incoming Labour Secretary of State. She's a very irreverent figure, vivacious and yet very much, um, you know, capable of dropping clangers when she arrives in Maryfield. Uh, and of course, she's undergoing treatment for cancer at this particular time for a brain tumour. Um, uh, it's interesting to read it. Uh, there's an account of that lunch. Um, uh, and we read the Quentin Th in, in a note to Quentin Thomas, uh, of the NIO in March 1997. Peter Bell, the British Joint Secretary, uh, notes that the Irish civil servants present were not really impressed by Mo Molum. He says, what has surprised me is the lack of enthusiasm Mr. Donoghue had evinced for Dr. Molum generally. And he felt that these views of the Irish civil servants uh, at Maryfield reflect the views, the wider views of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. He does not like the lady. She is, for example, flaky. Uh, neither she nor a party is seen as pro-nationalist. Um, and indeed, he describes the lunch, um, and uh, he goes on to say that uh, over lunch, Dr. Mola made a number of important points in her opening statement. She said that a future Labour government, um, a member of Labour would be in power two months later, would be committed to maintaining a good working relationship with the Irish. She also said that the balance of change in Northern Ireland was inevitably in a nationalist direction. It was therefore all the more important to address unionist concerns, including over the role of Maryfield. The, uh, thirdly, she said, a Labour government would support an inclusive talks process and try to bring Sinn Féin on board, but they also recognised the need to carry the unionists with them into an, a negotiated settlement. She rounded off her talk, by the way, by presenting the Irish and British Joint Secretaries after lunch with a, uh, uh, a, a kissogram set. Um, so the memo is actually called Snog of a Lifetime, memo in the NIO, uh, and so on. Um, what else can we say? As the ceasefire, of course, becomes more likely uh, in July 1997, the uh, multi-party talks are continuing at Stormont, including the UUP and the DUP, but excluding, of course, Sinn Féin. And um, we read of exchanges involving, for example, uh, Bob McCartney of the UK UP and his new colleague, Dr. Conor Cruz O'Brien, the former Irish statesman and uh, historian, um, who are obviously raising the question, will, will Sinn Féin be admitted into talks without prior decommissioning? And there's a touchy moment recorded at the kind of bilateral, in fact, multilateral talks on the 16th of July 1997. Um, this is on the very eve of the IRA ceasefire being resumed. The plenary was chaired by Harry Holkerridge. Remember him? The former Finnish uh, Prime Minister. And uh, Paul Murphy and Mo Molan were present. Uh, Robert McCartney launched an attack on the talks, uh, stating they were fraudulent as negotiations were going outside between the British government and Sinn Féin, which they were of course, to restore the ceasefire. Um, McCartney suggested that the British government was becoming as corrupt as those with whom they were dealing. And he said that the, quote, tactile geniality of Mo Molum was not going to take the talks forward. At this point, Seamus Mallon, who died this time last year, deputy leader of the SDLP, asked the chairman, Harry Holkerry, to rule that there was a difference between presenting a robust argument and personal abuse, such as that being displayed by Mr. McCartney, clearly towards Mo Molum at this stage. The chairman then asked participants to respect others in the exercise of free speech during this period. We can see how tetchy it was. The IR ceasefire is resumed. And uh, this finally, just to round off, 
A debate goes on in the summer of 1997 as to whether the highly secret Maryfield Secretariat, from which Irish officials are being helicoptered out, um, no meetings on Friday afternoon because they want to get back to Dublin and Cork, obviously to their families, high security, threats from loyalists, um, and uh, um, should they perhaps, um, you know, present um, the Maryfield Secretariat to the public um, in, in a more kind of um, uh, a softer way. Um, the idea comes actually from the BBC journalist, actually Stephen Grimison, at a St. Patrick's Day party in March 1997. And he talks about a, a fly on the wall documentary, something that will obviously humanize these faceless civil servants who are meeting daily to discuss parades, um, the demolition of Divis flats, you know, um, employment prospects west of the ban, and so much else. But mulling over the suggestion, Peter Bell, who seems to be his show this year, as a friend said, um, from the NIO, felt that the proposal might be a real too far. That's a good one for you. Um, um, as did his Irish counterpart, David Donoghue. And they, they said it was difficult to imagine how even a, an edited version of an internal secretariat meeting, British civil servants facing Irish civil servants on a fraught um, justice agenda would not give the impression that the Irish side was seeking to influence operational policing decisions. Now this idea drew a, a humorous response from Andy Wood, who was the NIO's Director of um, Information Services. Um, he was a familiar bearded figure um, at Stormont Castle in the early 1990s. Uh, he was uneasy about a TV programme, especially as the filming would take place during the, the tense marching season. We all know you do nothing. Um, during the marching season except March or depart on your annual holidays. Um, so it wouldn't be a good idea to film it. Um, anyway, uh, Wood believed that such a documentary would merely reinforce unionist perceptions of the Secretariat. And he added, of course, of course, he said, it's perfectly fair to argue that unionists will continue to believe that in addition to drawing up plans to unify Ireland, what else, you and your colleagues are also celebrating black mass, slaving over Ouija boards and the like, and that the only way to disabuse them of this perception is to show them what really goes on. Ah, but there's the rub, because they will continue to believe that you didn't see the hat of it. And in Wood's view, the Grimison proposal might make good television, but would be bad for NIO politics. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thanks very much, um, Eamon, for that, that review. Um, we're now going to hand over to, to Sam to do um, his, his comments on the release, and then we'll have a short Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much, David, and thank you, Eamon. And first of all, um, I, I want to join Eamon in thanking the, the staff of Prony this year, um, something that we do every year, but it's been a particularly difficult year, as you can imagine. Normally, we go down to the Public Record Office building, we get a big list of files, hundreds of file names, we try to guess what might be interesting, what might be boring, we order the file, we look at it, we send it back, we order another file. And it's a very, um, it's a very uh, laborious process, I suppose, for the staff who have to go down to the vaults and get those files and bring them up. This year, what they did was uh, they, they worked to digitize lots of those files, and that means um, a very um, labor intensive process of scanning or photographing every single page in um, many, many files. And not only did they do that, but they then set up quite complex arrangements whereby we could go down and see the other files that had not been digitized and we could see those. So thank you to David, to um, Leona, to all the other staff there, the IT staff, etc., cetera, um, because they were not only um, really uh, working to facilitate us and our um, newspapers or our broadcasters that we represent, um, but they were really working to facilitate the public and for each of you to be able to see um, what is in these files. And um, something then, um, which again has come up before at these events, but it, it, it gets more significant with every passing year. And that, that is the gulf now that exists between what is happening in Belfast and London, what is happening in, in Dublin, in the, in the Irish Republic. And it's, it's really unfortunate that we're now in a situation where in Belfast, we're getting files released 
from 1997 and in Dublin we're still stuck in 1990 um, and that is because for, for, for various reasons but there has been a delay in the implementation of the um, Irish legislation to move from a 30-year rule where files are generally declassified after 30 years to doing that after 20 years um, but it becomes a really significant disadvantage I think to um, someone like Eamon in particular um, as a historian trying to look at this trying to get as complete a picture as possible um, of what is happening on both sides of the border, on both sides of various talks processes. And so you get this very disjointed and really um, that, uh, really, a, an, an, an increasingly significant disjointed um, picture coming out here. And as we get closer to the present day, as, um, as in Belfast in, in, in particular, these files start to come closer and closer to today. And um, that, I think, becomes more significant. We know that the governments, um, certainly from the time of the Good Friday Agreement on, are incredibly um, well uh, linked. They are working together on a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis, about Northern Ireland. And yet, increasingly, we are going to be getting the British perspective on that um, many, many years in advance of what's happening in the, in the rest of the island. Um, and also something just in, in terms of the, the big picture here, which Eamon has um, alluded to, is that you, you've really got a sense of dramatic change in these files this year. There is a Labour government that comes in in 1997. It's New Labour, it's Tony Blair, it's Mo Molum. And it's really quite a radically um, different way of doing things. You also see things that are not necessarily linked to the change in government, but are linked to the change in how we live our lives. And um, things like um, more use of technology. And um, I think this is the first year where I have seen really significant use of email for the first time and um, it's still primarily um, something of a novelty and um, it's mostly diplomatic cables, it's um, formal memos between government departments or um, between um, internal government department divisions within the Northern Ireland office or elsewhere. But you are starting to see things change and I think that over the next few years that is going to become very dramatic indeed. Two of the stories which, um, which I, I, I focused on initially from these files were um, linked to Jerry Adams and to the really significant role that he is now assuming um, in the, the wider political process in Northern Ireland. And we see in these files, even though these files are from 1997, you always, as Eamon says, get some that lag maybe a few years, maybe right the way back to the Second World War. And there's a file which lags from 1994, and um, where Gerry Adams is privately going to the Irish government after the IRA ceasefire, and um, really within days of the, of the IRA ceasefire of 1994. And he is asking them to um, give preferential treatment to 11 IRA prisoners. Um, who are in southern jails. Now, unfortunately, we don't get the names of those prisoners. Um, if we got their names, it would be interesting to try to piece together what might have been going on there. But um, there is certainly a sense here that he values those prisoners and he wants to see something happen to those prisoners um, over the other Republican prisoners who are in the jails at that point. And the most significant element of this, I think, is that an apparent deal seems to be done with the Irish government on that basis. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the details of this are relayed in a memo which um, comes in August 1994, where two of the British and Irish government's most senior civil servants are meeting discreetly in London, um, as they did, to pass on information about how they're handling this um, really new dispensation um, of having the IRA on ceasefire for the first time in a very long time. And so um, the NIO Permanent Secretary, Sir John Chilcott, meets with Timothy Dalton, um, the top Irish official in the uh, Dublin Department of Justice. And um, this, this uh, meeting leads to this memo from Sir John into the British system. Um, but he is asking in it very um, pointedly and quite unusually for these memos for it to be treated with particular caution and sensitivity because of what is contained within it. And he says that one of the main topics that they wanted to talk about was prisoners. He says that Mr. Dalton was um, keen to tell the NIO that um, there would be a review of Republican prisoners' cases with a view to marginal easement in their earliest um, date of release from prison. Sir John said that um, Mr. Dalton was at pains to say that there would not be an amnesty or anything described as such, um, and they would not be, quote, overly generous, in part because of comparisons with ordinary criminal prisoners as he described them. Um, he suggested that remission may be increased from a quarter to a half. That might enable perhaps as many as 14 paramilitary prisoners to be, um, to be let out of jails in the south by about Christmas time, um, out of about 80 in total who were in jail at that point. But there would be no announcement of it, he said. It would simply happen. 
Um, he also said that there was likely to be a review of life sense of, of a life sentence and prison uh, uh, of uh, the life sense life sentence and prison population in southern jails. Um, and then Sir John also said that Mr. Dalton added, and Sir John has said, please protect especially that Adams had requested the Irish government for special dispensation in respect of 11 prisoners he did not specify as between fixed term prisoners and lifers who should be given particular consideration, although he emphasized there was no expectation of immediate or very early release. I was given to understand that in return for this, quote, generosity, that is the generosity of the Irish government to, towards these individuals, that the provisional IRA had given particular undertakings regarding full cooperation within prisons with the regime, an end to attempts to smuggle in arms and other objects, while on the government side it was likely that minor regime improvements would take place, such as the provision of colour televisions in cells. There's also a, 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 an, an entirely separate um, situation here, which um, Eamon has uh, referred to in part, and that is the uh, really significant change in Stormont in terms of how Stormont was running, um, in terms of how the NIO was operating, how people related to the Secretary of State and her style with Mo Mullum's arrival, um, but also how the Irish and British governments approached Northern Ireland. And there's a really interesting file. It's over um, a thousand pages, I think. It's really really vast to try to get through and it deals with one discrete aspect of this change and that is how they changed the public perception of Stormont, of Parliament buildings, of the Stormont estate and um, the meticulous detail that the government um, really puts into planning this change is really something to see. We see here the, the really um, laborious level of planning that, um, that Tony Blair personally was putting into this, that Mo Molum personally was putting into this, that the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service was putting into this, from really the smallest details, things like allowing people into the storm and grounds for what now seems entirely unremarkable things, like taking your dog for a walk um, in one of the beautiful grounds of, of the storm and estate, right the way up to the possibly giving away parliament buildings, giving away the storm and estate to the National Trust, renaming parliament buildings and that was something which ultimately fell flat because they struggled to come up with a better name basically for them and um, they looked at various alternatives and realized that assembly buildings were taken by the presbyterians in belfast and um, they looked at some of the government buildings in dublin which um, still bore the uh, names which they had under british rule and really decided that 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 wasn't something that, that could be improved upon but the really interesting thing here is just the level of um, high level government um, involvement in this. So there is there's an element of this that was known at the time. We know about the big concerts that ultimately came to um, to the grounds of the Stormont Estate with Sir Elton John, with other big acts coming to play there. And um, you too, obviously, after the agreement was signed. And um, but really, what this shows is that this was an exceptionally high priority for the government and that it went ahead despite the RUC being incredibly uncomfortable with it. We had, an, we had a, um, a very senior RUC officer and assistant chief constable saying that really to him, this seemed like madness and um, some of the things that they were being asked to, uh, asked, asked to consider. And he was saying that really it was opening up the storm and grounds, opening up key government buildings to um, really a very easy attack from Republicans or from anyone else who might want to do that if the ceasefires were to break down. And one of the um, one of the uh, memos which went from Dr. Molum to Tony Blair in Downing Street in late 1997 and um, really set out what the government was trying to do here in terms of re-imaging Stormont. But the more interesting um, aspect of that is the draft of that memo, which gives a more explicit sense, I suppose, of what the NIO and what Dr. Molum and the government was trying to achieve. And so in that memo, um, in that draft version of the memo, Dr. Molum was saying that as the former seat of the old Northern Ireland Parliament, Stormont was perceived by many nationalists as a symbol of unionist domination. And for uh, the last three decades, it had been encased in tight security. It wasn't a very welcoming place, she said, particularly to nationalists. She said that the building stands uh, ready physically now to be the centre of a devolved administration. And that really refers to the fact there had been a fire several years earlier that had now led to the, uh, to the to what is now the assembly chamber being rebuilt, being re, re, uh, reconstructed in many ways. And um, that work was pretty much complete. 
but she said that the building's ethos would not be ready for a new administration. At present, she said, it would not underpin the spirit of a new regional body. And eight days later, after the, um, the, the, uh, the final draft of that um, memo went to Mr. Blair, Tony Blair's private secretary, John Holmes, replied to say, the prime minister has seen Dr. Mullen's minute. He thinks these ideas are excellent and warmly endorses them. As you know, he remains very keen to see a, a series of major public events in Northern Ireland as the peace process moves on to help give the people of Northern Ireland the feeling that something new and exciting is happening of which they are part. And I think that if we fast forward to the present day, if we set aside what any of us think about New Labour or what any of us think about those ideas, this is a really wonderful example of what can be done with political power. Here is something which in some ways might seem pretty incidental to many people out there. They might think this is frivolous. Um, so, so what if Stormont is called by a different name? So what if people can walk their dogs in the estate or if a band comes in and plays a concert there? But the government and the civil servants had identified that this was potentially significant and they were um, really putting their chess pieces into place long before we got to Good Friday 1998. They were trying to think ahead strategically as to how that, um, that particular coup could be pulled off. And I think that if you um, look at the way in which once Tony Blair, once um, Mo Mullum as the ministerial authority within government had decided this was their priority, you see how the civil servants immediately click into action. The civil service is largely a hierarchical organization. And so they are taking their instructions from ministers. And um, we know that there are points where um, maybe a, a, a Sir Humphrey figure might not agree with what ministers are uh, saying to him. He might try to be obstructive. But fund fundamentally, if ministers want something to happen, it generally does happen, at least to a, to a certain extent. And so we have the head of the civil service getting involved, we have very senior civil servants being involved. And ultimately, this is what does happen. Um, and despite what the RUC wanted, despite their concerns, this is something which comes. And I think there's a really unflattering, content, uh, really unflattering contrast there with Stormont's leaders today, we've got Arlene Foster, we've got Michelle O'Neill in power now for over a year. And of course, there have been particular challenges with the pandemic, but really a lot of the time you don't get the sense that, um, that they really even know what they want to achieve, let alone set out um, on a course that is going to achieve that. And one of the, one of the other files here um, in, a, in a completely different vein, which shows that while the high politics of the peace process was going on, other things that were more relevant to some people's lives at that point, including the life of my father, who was a dairy farmer at this point, um, were also um, unfolding before us. And so there was the, the, the uh, spectre of BSE um, looming large over all of Northern Ireland, over all of the island of Ireland, over all of the UK and Ireland. And just three months before scientists told the government that evidence pointed to BSE transferring to humans, that that was becoming inescapably clear from the evidence, we see in one of these files that the Ulster Farmers Union was really vigorously lobbying the NIO to issue an unequivocal statement on the safety of beef. Um, they were talking in quite unflattering terms about some of those who were questioning um, what was being done here, people who were suggesting there could be a link and um, saying that the science was starting to stack up in that direction. And they were saying that this was devastating their industry and it was devastating their industry. Farmers were in a, in a very difficult situation. And yet what we see here, and um, we've got a copy of the um, memo which went from the, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food in Whitehall from their Secretary of State, Douglas Hurd, um, to the Prime Minister conveying this really um, devastating news. And you really get a sense from that memo of just the stunned, um, really, sense of what was coming ahead. They're looking at every possibility. They're looking at annihilating the entire national herd across the UK, killing every um, bovine animal across these islands, um, certainly on, on, on the British side of the border in the, in the, in the, in the island of Ireland. Um, and ultimately, one of the reasons that they decide not to go down that route is because they're not even sure at this point whether that would eradicate this dreadful disease. They wonder if it could be if it could be transferred through the grass and um, through the land that the cattle are grazing. And so there is a real sense of panic. And yet I think it's also a really stark example of how, for understandable reasons, the Ulster Farmers Union were were lobbying on behalf of their members and um, their members were feeling a lot of financial pain. 
Um, but actually, if they had got what they wanted at this point, just a few months before this link, this dreadful link between, um, between bovine and BSC and between CJD in humans was confirmed, that would not have been in the best interests of those doing the lobbying. If government had come out and given the public that unequivocal assurance, and we know that ministers have tried to do that many years before, and that ultimately um, managed to erode um, confidence in government. But at this point, where ministers did know that there was at least a significant possibility of that link being there, if they had done that, and then it had been shown that, that the link was undeniable, that would have been disastrous. Um, for any sort of confidence in government and in beef. And just coming, coming forward then, and um, finally to something again of a, of a totally different nature, um, and to uh, conclude on the cheery note, I suppose, of nuclear annihilation, um, there is here the, the really an old staple of these files, and that is um, really the, uh, the, uh, the planning on a contingency basis for what would happen in Northern Ireland. If the, Soviet, um, if the Soviet attack was to come um, towards the end of um, the Cold War, it wasn't known at the time. And this, this really stems from a file which is from the 1980s. And it's actually from the year that I was born, just about a, about a month before I was born in 1983. And they are looking at the possibility of what, what would happen, what would be left in Northern Ireland um, if there was to be a either conventional attack by the Soviets or a nuclear attack. And we're probably getting towards the last of these files, even though they lag a bit. And sometimes we find one that is that is out of place um, in, in, in terms of the chronological order of these files. I think there probably won't be very many more of these. And this is a document that was sent to members of the Northern Ireland Home Defence Planning Committee. And it was setting out the planning assumptions for defending Northern Ireland um, in the event of a major war. And it was really only <laughs> point that this would come from the Soviets. Um, this is now 37 years um, after the um, and the uh, five Northern Ireland targets that were judged to be most likely um, to be vulnerable to attack from the Soviets, most appealing to the Soviets for attack, are revealed in this file. There is an annex to the document which says that target one, as they expected it to be, would be RAF Bishop's Court at that point. That's now the racing circuit, which is Bishop's Court. Um, and that had been part oh, of the uh, service um, key uh, over the uh, North Atlantic. Um, although by the 1980s, it was um, really already being wound down. So perhaps this file was slightly out of date by this point. The other targets in um, probability, um, as, as anticipated by the British authorities, were Alder Grove Airport, that's now Belfast International Airport, Larne Port, Belfast Port, um, and Belfast City itself. And it was said that there was um, likely to be a period, um, if, if we were moving towards war, of increasing tensions, but signs of a move towards war um, before a nuclear attack. Um, and such a period, even though um, it may go on for some time, was warned to be perhaps as little as 48 hours to prepare. Said so that while the use of nuclear weapons at the outset cannot be ruled out, there is likely to be an initial conventional phase of operations during which important military targets would be attacked with conventional bombs and missiles and possibly chemical weapons. It says that chemical weapons are particularly suited to disrupting um, targets such as airfields and port facilities by denying access to the area except in protected clothing. Some produce a vapor hazard for considerable distances downwind. Decontamination of large areas is just not feasible. And really, um, it, it, it might seem strange to you suggest at the outset that this is something in any way cheerful, um, given the uh, really appalling um, apocalyptic um, sense of what would um, be left after such an attack. But I think that in the, in the context of where we sit today, um, sitting each of us um, in our homes, um, talking to each other through a screen, the um, really uh, quite chilling possibilities of the pandemic and some of the things that that has led to over recent months, I think this really helps to give me something of a perspective of the uh, sort of possibilities that faced my parents' generation. Um, and of course, we know that the, the troubles were a much more immediate and um, unavoidable um, part of their lives. Um, but I'm pretty confident that the author of that file um, never thought that anyone anywhere would ever look at that file and think that it was something that might cheer them up. That's all from me. Thank you.